Hello everyone, this is Sarah Hashmal from AIDS United. Welcome to the webinar, HIV Criminalization Reform, Repeal, Modernization, or Another Path. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a full agenda. So first, we're going to dive into some housekeeping items. This webinar is in listen-only mode. And Cindy, can you please mute your line while um, until Carrie's section? Great. Thank you. So the webinar is in listen-only mode. Um, you can call into the phone number on your screen or enable audio to listen over your computer, but you will not be able to speak to us. The way to communicate with us is you'll see a little chat icon in the bottom left of your screen. Send us a chat. I will get back to you. If you have questions for the panelists, if you're having trouble hearing us, that's the way to get to us. This webinar is being recorded, and the slides and recording will be available shortly following the end of the webinar at aidsunited.org backslash webinars. So a little bit about AIDS United. We're a national nonprofit organization with a singular mission of ending the HIV ep epidemic in the United States. We seek to achieve this mission through strategic grant making, capacity building, and policy advocacy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jonathan, to introduce himself and our panelists. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Peve, and I am the Pedro Zamora uh, Summer Public Policy Fellow at AIDS United. Um, over the past few months, um, I've been uh, very fortunate to uh, learn from and work with um, some of the brightest and some of the most passionate folks in the HIV field um, in terms of HIV communication. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have had um, this experience, and today's webinar is definitely a testament to that. Um, and a shameless plug, um, if you or anyone you know um, is interested in HIV advocacy or policy, um, I strongly encourage you or them to um, you know, learn more about the, the fellowship and apply. Um, you can visit their website for more information. Um, so um, I don't want to take too much time. Um, I'm very honored to um, introduce um, our presenters. Um, I'm very thankful um, for them for being willing to um, participate in this very much needed conversation um, despite their busy schedules. Um, before uh, I go ahead and introduce everyone, I just want to uh, quickly uh, highlight our goals for today's webinar. Uh, and we hope that by the end, uh, you all will get uh, a better sense of the current landscape of laws and policies that criminalize people living with HIV. Um, and as you may know, there are lots of opinions out there um, about how to get to change um, and really end these harmful policies. So we're hoping um, after today's webinar that folks will learn about uh, the differences between re uh, repeal, modernization, or alternatives uh, to HIV cr uh, criminalization punishment. Um, and lastly, we're also hoping to explore together uh, ways to empower individuals and advocates to take action and support movements um, in order to reform HIV criminalization laws in this country. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Um, I'll start off with uh, Brianna Diaz. Um, Brianna uses she and her pronouns, and she is a queer Latinx woman whose lived experience deeply informs her advocacy. Uh, she received her law degree from American University Washington College of Law, and she currently resides in D.C., but will forever be a proud Texan. Um, next, uh, we have Diala uh, Jodela Redding. Um, Jodela, uh, Diala uses she and her pronouns, and she currently is the senior policy advisor for uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who is from the 13th District of, of California. Um, since I already introduced myself, uh, the next person, our next presenter is Amir Sodegi. Uh, he, him pronouns. He currently serves as a National Community Outreach Coordinator at the Center for HIV Law and Policy. Uh, he earned his Master's of Arts in Philosophy from the New School for Social Research. Uh, he is an advocate for people who are incarcerated and in answering the severe social costs to the criminal punishment system. And next, uh, Sean Strube, uh, who is the founder of Pause Magazine. Um, he has been living with HIV for more than 35 years and is the mayor of Milford, Pennsylvania. 
He serves as the executive director of the CIRO Project, which is a U.S.-based national network of people uh, living with HIV that is best known for its work combating HIV communication. Um, last but not least, uh, we're very fortunate to be joined with uh, Carrie Thomas, who is an HIV communication survivor and activist. And Carrie is joining us directly from Idaho. And um, again, we're happy to have this conversation and welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, without further ado, well, actually, I'm just going to, we have the agenda on the slide for you all to see. Please feel free to follow along. And as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, feel free to interact with us in the chat box, um, answer your questions, which will be answered later in the Q&A se um, section. Um, and I, this time, I would like to turn it over to Sean um, as we begin this webinar. Great. Thank you, Jonathan, and, uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, <clears throat> This is, I guess, before I even get into the definition. Uh, a decade ago, there were very few people who even understood what was meant when we used the phrase HIV criminalization. So this is a movement that has come a very long way in a short period of time, and it's quite dynamic. Uh, it has changed how we understand this issue, uh, who's been getting involved, the strategies. Uh, uh, that is ever-changing, um, which is uh, uh, one of the joys of this, because those of us involved in it, it's, it's learning and expanding all the time. The definition that we use is that HIV criminalization, in its most basic way, is the unjust application or the inappropriate use of criminal law based on someone's HIV positive status. Now, that includes the states that have HIV specific criminal statutes, a law that might only apply to people with HIV. Um, we call that creating a viral underclass in the law. Most people think the law should apply to everybody the same way. But here we have one group of citizens being discriminated against with a different criminal statute because of the virus they carry. But it also happens under general criminal laws, um, meaning that a prosecutor will heighten a charge against somebody. You know, Willie Campbell is serving 35 years in prison in Texas for spitting at someone. Now, spitting at someone might be appropriate for some sort of misdemeanor charge. We don't want people going around randomly spitting at people. But 35 years in prison becomes wildly disproportionate to any potential kind of harm. So while there, about two-thirds of the states have these specific statutes, uh, the phenomenon happens everywhere um, in the country. Um, typically, prosecute people with HIV for perceived or potential HIV exposure unintentional HIV transmission uh, and or non-disclosure of one's HIV uh, status, uh, uh, usually before intimate contact, but also can be non-disclosure in other circumstances. Um, we always say perceived or potential HIV exposure rather than just sort of saying HIV exposure, uh, because simply because somebody uh, has intimate contact with someone, that is not necessarily an HIV exposure. Uh, it's a growing phenomenon. Uh, while many of the laws come from years ago, they weren't used as widely as they are today until recent years. Uh, and they undermine both human rights uh, and public health, and it's making the epidemic worse. Slide. Slide, please, okay. Uh, so, violate the human rights of people with HIV, create this viral underclass, treating one group of society differently. Uh, the punishments have been wildly disproportionate to any even potential harm, sometimes decades-long sentences, uh, sex offender registration, even for behaviors and situations that pose no HIV transmission risk. Um, uh, it's a violation of personal medical privacy, with profound stigmatization in the media, uh, frequently by inaccurate, if not hysterical, media coverage. Um, Zirconian sentencing, many uh, on this call, I'm sure, are familiar with Michael Johnson, who was recently released in Missouri. He was initially sentenced to 60 years. Um, and Carrie Thomas, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, who's a, uh, been a member of the board of the Sarah Project for years, um, is incarcerated in Idaho, serving 30 years. There was no accusation that he uh, uh, transmitted HIV to anyone. He didn't. Uh, and uh, so you have this incredibly draconian extreme sentencing slide. 
uh, sex offender registry and community notification. Robert Suttle, the assistant director of CERO and started CERO with me, um, served six months in Louisiana, but he has to have on his driver's license, you can see here the sex offender under his uh, picture. When he moved to Milford, when we were getting CERO going, he had to change his registration to Pennsylvania and our local police chief by law here in Pennsylvania had to go around to businesses and neighbors with this poster, Megan's Law, with a picture of Robert, uh, you know, obviously implying that he has some sort of threat to public safety, which anything, nothing could be further from the truth. Slide. But what is driving a lot of the, the interest in criminalization uh, today, um, quite frankly, you know, not that many people who care about the rights of those who living with HIV. I wish there were more, but there are a lot of people who care about public health and are now seeing how criminalization harms public health. First and foremost, it discourages testing. Uh, you can't be prosecuted if you don't know that you have HIV. And so people who are feeling fine, uh, they don't have any particular reason they think they get tested. Uh, they may come from a community that has all sorts of good reasons for having some degree of suspicion or distrust of the public health or criminal justice system. Why should they get tested and take on this legal liability? Uh, criminalization sows the distrust of public health. Uh, there's very good research now showing how it reduces uh, the willingness to participate and cooperate with counseling and partner notification programs, traditional public health strategies to, uh, to limit um, uh, further you know, spread of a sexually transmitted infection. It also creates an illusion of safety that leads to increased risk. One study in Minnesota, Keith Horvath, found that in uh, places where there was an HIV criminalization statute and gay men knew that it, such a statute existed, they were more likely to engage in unprotected anal intercourse. Uh, studies from years ago before U equals U, uh, but it supports this idea that creates this illusion of safety. Um, and there's a growing evidence base showing uh, this harm to public health. Most of the laws were in the U.S. were passed in the 80s and 90s. The first Ryan White Care Act included a provision that required states demonstrate they could prosecute what was called intentional transmission. Uh, about half the states said, we have assault statutes. If someone intends to transmit or to harm somebody, whether they use a gun or a baseball bat or a chair or a virus, we can prosecute it. And then a bunch of the other states went and passed this kind of patchwork collection of sometimes really crazy and illogical statutes. Um, but also, it's considered that at the time, um, uh, there were some people, prominent people in, in, in Aceburg, uh, in one case, that, that supported a statute. But the alternative that was being seriously considered was quarantine. Uh, people forget that in uh, 1985, there was a ballot initiative in California to quarantine people with HIV. Uh, it was ahead in the polls most of the summer, but fortunately we defeated it that fall. Um, prosecutions increased when effective treatment was introduced. Uh, people with HIV living longer, uh, that meant we would be around longer to potentially infect others, so we started being treated as an inherently dangerous population that need to be tracked down, regulated, tested, reported, listed, controlled. Uh, and this is part of a broader trend towards securitization of all sorts of disease, uh, leading to more invasive control measures uh, happening not just in the U.S. but around the world. Slide. Um, criminalization has a disproportionate impact on black and brown people, people who are living in poverty, those who are not virally suppressed or, or who are already mobilely criminalized because uh, they're gender non-conforming, use drugs, engage in sex works, or immigrants. Um, the U.S., Russia, Belarus, and Canada are the world leaders, um, but there are scores of countries that, that, uh, that have prosecutions. Um, CERO, uh, Positive Women's Network USA, Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, the AIDS Rights Alliance of Southern Africa, uh, Global Network of People Living with HIV, and the HIV Justice Network created a global consortium called the HIV, HIV Justice Worldwide. Uh, to coordinate a global response. And there are a lot of good resources uh, at that site. Slide. Um, there's been advocacy in a number of states. There's been uh, reform measures in, uh, uh, passed in Iowa, Colorado, California, Michigan, North Carolina. It was done uh, regulatory. There are active efforts underway in a number of other states, uh, all in varying stages of uh, where they are. Uh, 
think we're going to talk a little more about reform versus repeal, um, but I'd urge people not to fall into too much around those words because when you get into the individual state, it's very sort of custom to the, the political uh, context in that state in terms of what's possible. And there very often are difficult decisions that the advocates in a given state uh, uh, have to make. Um, federal efforts, there is a repeal act, uh, the Repeal HIV Discrimination Act that Barbara Lee has championed. Much of that has already been accomplished in different pieces requiring some studies and some things. And, uh, and it's now uh, being worked on now for potentially being reintroduced this year. Um, science, the, the most powerful argument that we've found, and we've done some research on this nationally, that gets people open to the idea of repealing or revising these statutes is that the law has not kept pace with the science. You know, while people might not understand much about undetectable and so on, they know that it's different having HIV today than it was years ago. And so there's a logical leap to, you know, we know more about the science, the reality of the disease is different today. Um, therefore, it makes sense that the laws should be updated. Um, modernization is a word we frequently use when dealing with the legislatures um, uh, because that sort of underscores the idea of the modern with the contemporary science. Modernization could mean repealing a statute. Uh, it could be amending a statute. It's just a, a word that is... It really came from the AIDS director in the state of Iowa, Randy Meyer, who we were having a meeting and someone said it might have been me, something about this law the stupid legislature passed. And uh, Randy said sort of dryly, he says that we find that the Iowa Department of Public Health, when we go to the legislature to ask them to change the law, uh, we don't tell them they were stupid. We tell them the law needs to be modernized. We have more information. Uh, people living with HIV have been very much centered in this work. And in fact, the, uh, the, uh, a number of people who have been criminalized uh, have, uh, have really championed this and, and have attracted the attention, the advocacy uh, that we needed. Um, CERO produces the HIV is not a crime uh, national training academy in partnership with other national networks, Positive Women's Network, Thrive SS, Positively Trans, the USPLA HIV Caucus that really seeks to further develop the leadership and expertise. Uh, around uh, a criminalization reform slide. Uh, here are several documents. Uh, last summer uh, in Amsterdam, HIV Justice Worldwide, we released an expert consensus statement on HIV and the law with Nobel laureate and leading scientists around the world. Um, the CDC statement on effectiveness of prevention strategies uh, came out recently. It's really good. Prevention access campaigns do equals you consensus statement and treatment as prevention consensus statement that uh, CHLP led uh, that really looks at how we deal with, uh, um, with, with you know, people who are undetectable because we find legislators, sure, they'll change it for people who are undetectable. They don't want to do for others. And so that creates a whole other level of complexity with it. Slide. Um, organizations, you're, anyone is welcome to join the CERO listserv, which is about 800 people, uh, a whole range of issues around empowerment of people with HIV, but mostly around criminalization related issues. It's a good place to ask questions, get informed, kind of be checked in with the, the flow of, of, of this advocacy. Um, you can also connect with state efforts um, uh, by emailing us. We'll connect you with people in your state. Uh, our training academy is next summer, and there's a whole scholarship process uh, for people who are interested in attending that, and we're eager for volunteers and the different work groups uh, that are already working on planning that. Uh, HIV Justice Worldwide, that's their website. Uh, Lambda Legal does work on this. Center for HIV Law, Law and Policy does work on this. And the Williams Institute, the last one here, has done some really in-depth research in, in several states that is very helpful. Whether you're in that state or not, if you're working in another state, you can look at the research that they've conducted and, and find that uh, to be helpful. Slide. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, AIDS United. Uh, and, uh, and thanks to all of you for participating. Thank you, Sean. And now we'll turn it over to Carrie. Yeah, uh, thank you. What a great opportunity. Um, well put, Sean. I think you put things in really in context. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of my personal experience. Uh, believe it or not, yesterday uh, I turned 55 years old. Uh, the guys around here, I'm currently incarcerated. The guys around here call it the double nickel, so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of nice. 
And I'm currently also in my 11th year of my 30-year sentence for non, not disclosing my uh, HIV status to my sexual partner. Uh, so that's Idaho's HIV criminalization statute. Um, and I've been HIV positive for 31 years, which is over, clearly over half my life and for the most part all of my adult life. So during the, the 11 or the 31 years, uh, I, at that time I thought myself to be a good person. Um, I raised a son who, who now has two beautiful children of his own, um, my granddaughter Amina, who is, will be four in September, and my son Roman, who is currently two. Uh, I've always considered myself a, a hard worker uh, at jobs, and, and I would volunteer in, in my community. And I also practiced all the things that I knew to be essential to uh, protect my sexual partner. Uh, things like I work closely with my doctor, I consistently maintained an undetectable viral load, and I, and I always used a condom. So in terms of criminalization, uh, had the science of HIV transmission been taken into account during my case in, in uh, 2008, the argument is that I wouldn't have been sentenced to 30 years in prison and may not have been uh, charged at all. So, but a couple of challenges that I have when talking about HIV in the context of my criminal history is that I'm, that I'm talking about HIV health, about illness, and also about grieving. But in the same breath, I'm talking about maneuvering the complexities of the criminal justice system and, and the prison system uh, specifically. So the last thing that I've ever wanted to do is contribute, contribute to the misunderstanding or any stigma that already exists around uh, or associated with HIV and AIDS. But on a personal level, at the time of my arrest, uh, I felt, uh, instead of feeling supported, I was definitely shamed. I felt shunned and dismissed. Uh, in prison, and certainly in court, all I heard were the conversations which I was judged to be a threat to society or a threat to public safety. Now keep in mind that I never publicly complained. I never screamed or did I, did I make a, a cause of scene at any time. But internally, I was just simply sad, you know, just very sad, and I felt shamed inside all that pain. And the backlash of that blame was intense and even penetrating. But pointing, uh, pointing out that I did something wrong or ridiculous or even impetuous and that I was a criminal. I felt judged, shunned, corrected, dismissed. I felt misunderstood and helpless and foolish in the face of all the grief I was feeling at the time. So during the time of great pain and confusion, I stood by completely helpless. Uh, I fumbled for words, not knowing that words at that time couldn't do anything to make it right. So like many people who were charged under the non-disclosure laws, I stopped talking about the pain. It was easier for me to just simply pretend that everything was going to be fine and continually defend, to continually defend or try to explain the grief of those who, who didn't even make the attempt to understand. All I wanted at the time was, was other grieving people because they were the only ones that I believed that could understand the suffering I was going through, but I couldn't find any. I couldn't find a community that would support that. So when seemingly all the community, definitely in, in Idaho, was telling me that I was unsalvageable, it's taken now to this point an act of what I call uh, fear, self-love, and a tenacity to continue to keep showing up and to continue to look for support inside all the pain that's been going on inside my life. So today, with the support of the Zero Project uh, and through the, what I call my, my responsibility or my, the, my ability to choose how I'm going to respond, um, that's when I started to become a true advocate for HIV. And along the way, I've set some, some really strict goals that I want to return back to society and do my part to help out in any way possible with, it, with these statues. Um, I want to, to stand on my own two feet with my dignity still intact. And I made a goal to choose to live as a man rather than as a prisoner and again serve my time with dignity. And I also wanted to live a life of relevance. And to do that, the action step that I've taken along with working with Ciro is to work toward educating myself, not simply with HIV and HIV laws, but, uh, but and educate myself in anything possible that goes on in the facility to either help, to help other people around. I also wanted to rec reconcile uh, with society. I wanted to contribute to my community, which of course starts in prison, and I wanted to build a, a network of support, which is part of why I'm doing, I'm speaking out today. So what I want to end with, my obsession, my obsession, if you will, for striving to make, the, the make my community in here and the community in Idaho around me a better place comes from the fact that I once believed that, that life was fierce and, and formidable. And my session uh, with freedom comes from the fact that mine has been taken away. And my passion for learning, for growing, for sharing the tools of change comes from the fact that I personally felt the pain 
of what seemed to me at the time to be an unbearable injustice and indifference. So for me, I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today, to come out and, uh, and support everything that we're doing to try to change these statutes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kerry, for sharing your story. Definitely moving. Um, and now we're going to turn it over to uh, Amir uh, from um, the Center uh, for Public Pol for HIV Law and Policy. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Kerry, for sharing your story and, and Ciro for the work you're doing. It's, you know, a painful reminder of why we do the work we do, and. Uh, my name is Amir Sadegi. I'm the National Community Outreach Coordinator at the Center for HIV Law and Policy, and I work on our Positive Justice Project and Teen Sense. Um, and here's my contact information. I can make these slides available to you um, if you'd like them. I have a lot of information to cover and not a whole lot of time, so I'm going to jump straight into it. And here's kind of a snapshot of some of the work that we do, and I feel really privileged to get to work on um, a cool project, which is the uh, Positive Justice Project's National Advisory Group. It's a venue for 48, 42 advocates and experts across the country to provide input and feedback on our guiding principles, which really ground the kind of reform and legislative approach that we do. And so first, let's take a look at what actually has happened um, to HIV criminal laws over time. We have this survey which uh, gives us a laid out view of when HIV criminal statutes were written and when they were amended um, and when those substantive kinds of changes happened as well. And we can also see that laid out here as a timeline, those more substantive changes to HIV criminal laws um, beginning with Texas's repeal in 1994 to the more recent changes. And what we can see from that survey is that of the 37 states that were researched, 20 made substantive changes. So while there were other changes that weren't substantive, um, a, a good deal of them changed the law in a significant way. So what that tells us is we can bust a few myths right away, that it is not true that HIV criminal laws were adopted um, way back when people knew little about HIV. And some of those substantive changes made the laws more severe rather than less severe. Um, bills to increase the scope and penalties of current laws continue to be introduced around the country. So what are the options then for reform and why talk about modernizing an HIV-specific criminal law rather than doing an outright repeal? That, I think it would help us to define some of these terms. And repealing means legislators completely remove an HIV-specific law from the state codes. But that leaves prosecutors with wide discretion to use the, criminal, the general criminal code against people living with HIV. Modernization was a term chosen in early discussions with officials to describe reform or repeal of HIV criminal laws. And the strategy being that by appropriating the term that CDCs and state health officials used to describe changes to HIV testing laws, we put HIV criminalization on the modernized to-do list. And then what about reform or an effective repeal? Changing the law to make prosecution, the prosecution of people living with HIV nearly impossible in all but cases with clear proof that a person acted with the intent to cause harm by transmitting HIV and in a manner reasonably likely to do so. Um, the goal then is to cabin prosecution of person-to-person -person disease transmission in a single law and limit the prosecutor's ability to use the general criminal code. There are other options too, right? Restorative justice, but that starts with the assumption that harm has already been done to another person. So in the context of HIV criminal laws, it doesn't really challenge the premise that people living with HIV harmed a person by not disclosing their status. So what options do advocates have in the states? And where did we see criminal laws improve or change? As I mentioned, Texas was the first state to do an outright repeal of its criminal law, and that's the good news. There's no HIV-specific criminal law in the state code. 
The bad news is that prosecutors target people living with HIV with the general criminal code. And there have been um, charges and convictions of aggravated assault, aggravated sexual assault, and even attempted murder. Illinois followed, and the good news was that prosecutors have to prove specific intent to commit the offense and constrain the kinds of sexual activity that can be criminalized to only include anal and vaginal, in vaginal intercourse. But prosecutors can subpoena medical records to show knowledge of HIV status. The courts continue to infer intent to harm from intent to have sex while living with HIV. And transmission is not required for a felony conviction. In Iowa, the really great positive change is that mandatory sex offender registration was eliminated, and that even applies to retroactively. And the law, the revision also narrowed the definition of intent, but kept a possible 25-year fel uh, felony penalty and added other diseases eligible for felony conviction. People living with hepatitis, tuberculosis, meningococcal disease are subject to prosecution. And it's prosecution only for behaviors that pose a substantial risk, which is an improvement for HIV, but it's a problem for tuberculosis because it's a disease that can be transmitted casually. Um, these, you know, these diseases are often stigmatized and poorly uh, understood and are m more likely to affect vulnerable, marginalized communities. So that's something to keep in mind. Colorado, the good news is it reduced penalties for people convicted of sex offenses who tested positive for HIV, eliminated mandatory HIV testing and felony sentence enhancements for sex workers living with HIV, which is an important change because anecdotal evidence suggests that sex workers in Colorado were the primary target for prosecution. Still, there are pretty severe sentence, um, sentences for people convicted of a sexual, uh, sex offense where transmission is alleged. So there's good news and there's bad news. California saw the most sweeping set of reforms, reduced penalties basically across the board, including um, for HIV-related sex work convictions, but left HIV-specific enhancements for convictions related to sex offense unchanged. North Carolina, is a peculiar case because there's no HIV-specific criminal statute, but there are control measures in the state code. And the change made it so people living with HIV must either disclose their status prior to sex or wear a condom unless they adhere to a treatment plan and have been virally suppressed for at least six months, or their partner is also living with HIV and taking PrEP, or taking PrEP. And a viral divide is a particularly unfortunate choice in a state where access to reliable quality care, PrEP, and other basic health, information, uh, health services are not readily available to those greatest, at greatest risk of HIV, and not to mention prosecution. Michigan narrowed the scope of punishable sexual activities to include only vaginal and anal intercourse, but there's an offense laid out in the statute where someone can face a felony charge even when transmission has not occurred or harm has not occurred. And also, for many courts, reckless exposure just means sex while living with HIV, which highlights, you know, to circle back to our, our point of an effective repeal and the importance of that model to constrain the prosecutor's ability to bring charges only to cases where there's a specific intent to harm and harm actually occurs. So, we can see that there are many uh, states involved in addressing their HIV and challenging their HIV criminal laws across the country, and you can subscribe to our PJP update um, to receive uh, a newsletter about those changes if you'd like to stay informed. And what are maybe some lessons learned if the goal is to stop prosecutions of people living with HIV, viral hepatitis, or other infectious diseases? What is the best way to do that? I think some of the key takeaways are that we should be cautious of a total repeal because it can leave prosecutors with wide discretion on applying a discriminatory application of the general criminal code. Coalitions should be broad and as inclusive as possible, and that the political realities are significant to the degree determined by the size and breadth of the coalition actively involved in that campaign. And 
you know, political math and expediency is important, but it's a rationale that's used again and again to undermine the rights of people who have less political capital. So if you have a broad and inclusive coalition of people who are sex workers, people who inject drugs, folks from the harm, re harm reduction coalition actively organizing in the state, you can make sure that a change doesn't undermine the groups who are most likely to be uh, to face a criminal charge. And some observations I think we can make is that too much HIV literacy work with policymakers is a de defensive education that is done at the time the bill is being promoted. And we need to focus on more proactive education and broad agreement on our guiding principles for reform and coalitions feel pressured by that pragmatism or political expediency rather than a broad reform. And I think a, a good example to remember is the Employment Non-Discrimination Act that originally left behind trans people even though trans people reported higher rates of discrimination. And I think a few proposals that I'd like to highlight are that HIV literacy for lawmakers, have it proactive, have it before each legislative session with the Department of Health, physician, nurses, to do a session called What Every Policymaker Should Know About Sex and STIs. And offer donuts, they're gonna come. Don't wait until you want to change to do that defensive education. Make friends with your local prosecutors. Follow the science that matters for reform and look at the data that shows who bears the brunt of the uh, HIV criminal legal uh, enforcement and keep those guiding principles at the core of organizing efforts. Um, and most importantly, greater investment in local co uh, coalitions and compensating unemployed or underemployed people living with HIV, people living with viral hepatitis and other stakeholders and activists for their contributions and their time. So thank you for having me. That's, what, uh, that's my presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amir. Um, next, uh, we're going to hear from Diala uh, from Congresswoman Barbara Lee's office. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for um, having me on the call today. Um, I really appreciate being invited. And it was it's powerful to hear from all the advocates and experts on this issue, and especially powerful to hear Carrie's personal experience with these laws. Um, so as our other speakers mentioned, there are serious public health implications for continuing to have HIV criminalization laws on the books, um, to, you know, discourages testing, as people have mentioned, and further stigma, which we already know serves as a major barrier in addressing the HIV epidemic. Um, Congressman Lee has been working on these, this issue for decades and plans to reintroduce her Repeal HIV Discrimination Act. So I'll quickly go over um, what the bill does and as... Um, folks mentioned earlier on the call, we worked with AIDS United and um, a lot of stakeholders, including folks on this call, to get feedback on updating the bill for reintroduction. So we should have it ready to go when Congress comes back in session in September. Um, and I know uh, folks have also talked about um, how to address the issue of straight repeal versus modernization. So this bill kind of walks the line on both. <laughs> um, every bill in Congress needs to have a um, uh, a catchy title. Um, so the bill is the repeal existing policies that encourage and allow legal HIV discrimination acts. So we can call it the repeal HIV discrimination act. But in other parts of the bill, it talks about modernizing, um, modernizing these state laws. So the repeal um, act addresses HIV discrimination and the use of criminal and civil commitment laws against those who test positive for HIV by providing states a path forward to modernize their current criminal laws that target people living with HIV. Um, it does this by requiring the Attorney General, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the Secretary of Defense to work with um, state stakeholders to review the laws, policies, and cases that impose, impose criminal liability on people living with HIV to develop a set of best practices for the treatment of HIV in criminal and civil commitment cases, issues guidance to states based on best practices, um, the Department of Justice under yeah. the Obama administration released a best practices guide to reform 
HIV-specific criminal laws to align with scientifically supported factors in July of 2014. So we do have that, but it's good to continue to point to that. And then um, requires them to monitor the efficacy of state policy changes um, and to see if they're not consistent, they are or not consistent with best practices. Obviously, I know there's concern about um, requiring the current AG and current head of HHS and um, DOD under this administration um, with, with to require them to undertake some of these things, given that we, we know how harmful Trump administration policies are to ending the HIV um, epidemic is. But um, we also know that this bill is not going to pass um, this year. So it's something that we can work towards when we have a more friendly um, and, and smart administration. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll just give a very brief history of Congresswoman Lee's work on this issue. Um, as I mentioned, she's been working on it for decades, and she was the only U.S. representative representative on the U.N.'s Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Um, she worked on this internationally as well to um, lift the international travel ban that prevented people living with HIV and AIDS from traveling or immigrating to the United States and worked with um, Senators Kerry and Gordon Smith to repeal uh, push for a repeal of the travel ban as part of the PEPFAR reauthorization. Um, and then under Obama, it was officially lifted. And um, she's continued to do outreach to state legislatures since obviously we can't, um, as federal lawmakers, she can't um, work directly on repealing state laws, but she has continued to do outreach to state legislators across the country, encouraging them to do work um, to address these discriminatory laws. Um, and she obviously worked closely with local stake stakeholders leading up to Governor Brown signing SB 239, which was California's HIV decriminalization law, which was talked about earlier. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of what folks on the call can do, can do and what stakeholders on the call um, are already great at doing, including AIDS United, um, once we introduce the bill, hopefully in September, um, ask your representatives to co-sponsor the legislation. Um, we have over 60 new members of Congress in the 116th Congress. Um, a lot of them are new to these issues. For them, co-signing a bill means it's a new position for them because they've never had to take a position on these things. So there is a huge education gap currently in Congress, um, but I think we've, there's a lot of potential there as well. So they all need to be touched and educated on this issue. There's two big hooks in terms of um, bringing attention to why addressing these discriminatory laws um, should be a priority. One is obviously the Trump administration rolling out its end the HIV epidemic initiative. The congresswoman um, met with all the principals who are in charge of coming up with this initiative and asked them point blank about um, addressing HIV criminalization laws as part of ensuring the success of the initiative. Um, we obviously can't, we know we can't and the HIV epidemic in the U.S. Um, with these laws on the books and with the Trump administration continuing to promulgate anti-LGBTQ and other policies that adversely impact people live, living with HIV. So while the Congresswoman, um, I think like a lot of folks, applauded the administration's attention to um, ending the HIV epidemic in the U.S., um, she's made it clear when the Secretary of Health and Human Services came to testify um, and one meeting with principals from the administration that um, that they need to address all these other crazy things <laughs> coming out of the administration in order for the initiative to be successful. Um, the other big hook is AIDS 2020. So obviously we know that there's um, uh, not widespread agreement, let's say, in the community about um, hosting the International AIDS Conference in the U.S. under the Trump administration. The congresswoman has similar concerns and is trying to do everything she can to address stakeholder concerns on this. Um, but she does think it's an opportunity to bring international attention to the harmful policies from the Trump administration and HIV uh, criminalization laws that are on the books. Um, and to really show that while the U.S. has global leadership in addressing the HIV epidemic and needs to do a lot of work here at home, um, so having the conference in the U.S. Um, 
gives a really big spotlight on the epidemic here and on um, the state laws that folks on the call have gone over in terms of how they impact the, um, the epidemic and people living with HIV. So that's it for me. Thank you again for having me on the call. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, Brianna, uh, please take it home for us um, as we are <laughs> wrapping up soon. All right, great. Yeah, so thank you so much to everybody who's, you know, shared their expertise and knowledge on this issue. Um, for everybody on the call, you know, we've gone over um, what are HIV criminalization laws, what is their history, why were they created. We've gone over various advocacy uh, campaigns, whether that's repeal, modernize, or reform, and we've gone over um, one, like, one potential <laughs> um, solution to the issue at the federal level. And we also had a phenomenal person share their story about how they were directly impacted by this. So you've seen a lot um, and you learned a lot. And now you're probably wondering what it is that I can do to address this, um, this issue. And there's a lot you can do. Um, so I'm going to be sharing what the Positive Women's Network in particular does to address HIV criminalization issues. Um, so real quick, uh, PWN is we're an organization that prepares and involves women and people of trans experience living with HIV and all our diversity, including gender identity and sexual orientation in all levels of policy and decision making through leadership development, organizing and mobilizing on issues and elections, policy advocacy at the state and federal level, and through strategic communications. Slide. Um, so yeah, I just want to do a quick slide about putting advocacy to practice, right? And we know there's various stakeholders involved. I'm sure we have community advocates on the phone. We have policymakers, whether that be lawyers or um, staffers, legislators, anybody who's interested in writing and implementing policy, and public health officials um, at any level. Um, we know that outreach and education is a huge focus of the work um, as we try to put together and lead HIV criminalization, um, modernization, or appeal efforts. Um, and we've seen the most success in doing that through outreach and education, whether that's town halls or briefings on the Hill, uh, community training so you can educate your community about their rights, how these issues impact them, and what should be done about it, and even hosting lobby days um, to make this issue known. So, slide. Uh, so first I want to talk about how important it is that when you're building your, your movement, it's really important that you know your state law. I know we've highlighted a couple state laws already and how they've changed. So very briefly I want to say, you know, for example, Florida is a state that um, has penalty enhancers for sex workers within their HIV criminalization code. So on the basis of HIV status alone, the punishment in Florida for offering to exchange sex for any form of resources, which can be an act that does not require any physical contact jumps from a misdemeanor punished by 60 days in jail to a felony punished by up to five years incarceration. So it's really important to know that when you want to do moderniz like modernization, repeal, or reform in your state campaign, you have to know your state law because it's not as easy as looking at what another state did and say, hey, why don't we just grab their bill and try to introduce it here. Every law is different, and you have to know how those differences can have really direct, specific impacts on particular uh, populations. Next. Um, in addition to knowing your state law, we all know that a successful movement is done through coalition building, right? Um, so movements can uh, create change, and movements consist of hosts of different people as well as organizations. Movements consist of organizations that share your values, and those who don't exactly share your values or who share them but do not uh, to the extent you, your organizations do. So an example is reproductive health versus reproductive rights versus reproductive justice. <laughs> like they all have one central goal. They might just go about it a little bit differently or prioritize policies in different ways. So we all know that HIV criminalization impacts the communities all three of those organizations focus on. Um, so some organizations may focus on simply helping people living with HIV understand what they understand that they can live full lives and helping access health care needs. Others may focus on that as well as discuss and advocate against the criminalization of those living with HIV, as well as educate and advocate on how other issues relate. So how these, things, how these criminal statutes disproportionately affect people of color, affect low-income folks, and whether they can access care and support needed. So even though organizations might have different focus areas and serve specific populations, um, 
we're all going to be intersecting at some point at, on this particular issue of HIV criminalization. So when you're trying to build a network of like, like-minded advocates and allies, make sure you include people like sex worker rights, anti-incarceration movements and abolition movements in your work, and also look at LGBTQ organizations and again, reproductive rights, health and justice organizations. Slide. So once you've formed your coalition, like once you know your state law, once you are forming your coalition, you've got to create, share, and collect resources. As you can imagine, this is a very complicated issue um, on, on every level, but because it varies state by state, um, and because it's not something that's really discussed, I don't know how many times we've had meetings with state legislators or even prosecutors, and we say, hey, you have an HIV criminalization law on the book, and we want to we want to change that. They're like, oh, we had no idea that existed, um, which is a little bit shocking, uh, but it happens. And so whenever you're wanting to build an advocacy movement around this issue, you have to create tangible resources, and you also have to rely on people power. So regardless of what you're doing, do these things. Um, these resources can be in the form of, you know, finances, because you've got to compensate people for the work they're doing, educating the public through policy reports, issue briefings, fact sheets, and like, this webinar that we're doing, and op-eds are great ways to educate everybody on this particular issue. Next slide. One of the most critical pieces of doing this work that I think we always have to remember uh, if we ever want to get involved or start a movement in our community is that you have to center the community you're serving. Um, sometimes we're advocating for issues we have, um, issues we have or currently experience. Sometimes you're simply allies to a broader community on an issue. Regardless, it is important to center those who are actually impacted by the issue, especially those who are normally silenced. So we know that whether you're an advocate or ally, you should always center the most impacted. And that for HIV criminalization is typically black and Latinx people living with HIV. So we have to make sure that when we're um, engaging with communities that want to get involved in this at the local or state level, um, we are going to the communities most impacted and making sure they have a seat at the table and that their needs and concerns about the law is heard, listened to, and met. Um, use their experiences and their stories to influence and educate. Hold a press conference, read a letter from a fellow community member, even testify at a committee hearing for or against legislation. Storytelling is a powerful mechanism for change, especially when talking about HIV criminalization. However, I do want to share that even though you have a story to share, you have a story to tell, especially if it's somebody else's, you need to get consent. <laughs> There's a lot of time that we might prop up somebody, use somebody's stories um, in a very tokenizing way or um, expose them without their consent. And disclosing somebody's personal life is never okay without consent. So when you want to go this route of starting to center the community, make sure that you're fully informing a community member about what they're getting into, um, what might be asked of them. And if they're asked to share their story, you get full consent. We don't want to disclose personal business. All right, next. So, <laughs> examples of what P PWN is up to on this particular round um, or issue. So, we have multiple chapters across various states. We have about 12, what is it, 12 chapters in 12 different states right now. And um, we have two in particular that are working on HIV criminalization. Uh, one is our team in South Carolina. Um, and there, they have created the South Carolina Dream Team, which is a coalition that is led by PWN members. Um, and is working to build an intersectional statewide coalition to decriminalize HIV. Um, South Carolina has a very bad law, as you can only imagine, um, on this issue. And the South Carolina Dream Team is yet composed of various legal um, organizations and advocacy organizations, but the core of it is composed of um, people living with HIV in South Carolina. They are the ones that are doing the community outreach, the training, um, the this lobbying, um, and they are the ones that are actually helping draft the bill. <laughs> so again, centering the community that's directly impacted, they should be leading the work. And I believe that our South Carolina team is one of those uh, really bright examples of that in action. We also are a participant in the Florida HIV Justice Coalition, which is composed of PWN, Zero Project, Swoop, Equality Florida, Behind Bars, and the ACLU of Florida. Um, the Florida Coalition, it, it produces resources by the community for policymakers. It leads advocacy days. 
and training for the community. Um, as we've, I think all of us have said, that's a really critical part in doing this work. Um, change does not occur immediately. <laughs> Policy is a, a battle of incrementalism. And so it takes a lot of community outreach to make sure people fully understand the issue, that we all understand you know, the goal that we're trying to achieve and we do everything our, that we can to get there. Um, so yeah, slide. Awesome. So thank you so much for spending an hour listening to us try to tell you about this really horrible issue, but also listening and trying to find ways to work together with us to try to address it. So here's my contact information if you'd like to get involved. Thank you. Yes, thank you indeed to all of our presenters for definitely enlightening us um, and sharing their expertise around uh, this very important issue. Um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to um, Sarah, our communications manager, who will moderate the Q&A uh, section. Thanks, Jonathan. So at this time, for folks who can stay on with us, we'd love to do some Q&A with you. We've got one question already in the chat box. So I'm going to just read that aloud and direct it to one of our presenters. And if you have other questions, put them in the chat box and we'll get to it. Some of our presenters are able to stay long, so if you're able to stay long, you know, let's continue the conversation. So Amir, I think this question is best directed to you first, and then if any of the other panelists want to jump in, feel free. Somebody asked a question about where does evidence of taking your HIV treatment and your adherence fit into current HIV criminal laws? Thank you. I, um, I hope uh, that person's still on the call because I can kind of see that they might have left. But a few states off the top of my head have provisions to add a defense to prosecution if, y if you were virally suppressed, like Michigan, North Carolina, and Iowa. But I think the lesson is that while a few have that added defense to prosecution if you were adhering to a treatment reg regimen and have an undetectable viral load, many states do not have, you know, take no consideration into uh, the amount or risk or degree of harm done. And, you know, people can be subject to prosecution across the country in many, many more states, um, even if they are virally suppressed. Because there, there are states where transmission does not have to occur, to occur for someone to face a felony conviction. And I'm also kind of generally worried that we don't want to hinge criminal liability on whether someone has access to um, antiretroviral treatment or not, because that may and will likely deepen um, and, and, and uh, you know, widen the gaps in between those who are most likely to be um, targeted by HIV criminalization and those who are not. And, you know, it stacks and scaffolds onto folks who are most likely to be targeted by criminal legal enforcement, period. Thanks so much, Amir. For any of our panelists want to add anything to that? If not, I have other questions in queue. Okay. Um, Sean, I'm going to direct this to you if you're still on the line. What if somebody who's HIV negative brings a charge against me for HIV non-disclosure? Uh, Sean, you can perfect. Go ahead. If, if someone does that, um, uh, I mean, the very first thing is to get good legal help, uh, and that can be difficult. You know, we have a... a a brochure that we make available to the kinds of things that people can do to potentially protect themselves from prosecution. Uh, some people are dating someone, they may take that person with them to a, a doctor's appointment or something and disclose in the presence of that person and get that recorded so it's a third party who knows that they disclosed. Um, but the most important thing is if you have any concern that you might be facing prosecution, is to get legal assistance right away. Um, uh, I mean, I've, I've got, I've, that's the main thing that I can say. I mean, there are lots of things within that, but I, I hate to give people any advice other than to, 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 you know, to find an attorney. Typically, you know, groups like the ACLU or Lambda, uh, Center for HIV Law and Policy, you know, other groups that have a lot of legal expertise around this issue, they don't take on representation 
at these individual cases with some exceptions, particularly on appeal, but they're really good about having resources uh, to help and support the attorney someone does find to represent them locally or their, or their public defender. Thanks, John. Um, Brianna, this next question is for you. Um, how would you respond to somebody who says that there needs to still be a way to hold people who are intentionally transmitting HIV to others accountable? So what do we do if, if someone says that? I'm so sorry. Those oh, no, that's great. Out. No, that's, let me um, repeat myself. How would you re respond to someone who's sharing that, okay, they hear about modernization, but how, what should we do about the people that they say are intentionally transmitting the virus? What's your response to that? Um, so, you know, when we're talking about intent, um, I know there are reform uh, movements within the community that want to change the way um, that we define the criminal code in this specific instance where if there is an individual who wants to intentionally transmit HIV, like we have specific intent crimes. Um, so maybe possibly applying those to that particular case. Um, but I, I would probably defer that answer to one of our legal organizations. Well, I, if, you know, if there's one kind of thought that I have um, is that 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 brings that would help us bring uh, an HIV criminal law in line with the long-standing legal principle that we only punish people who intend to harm someone else, and that's ex uh, that's exactly what. Here. Oh yes, yes. Can you start over? I didn't hear the first part of your response, so I'm just in case others didn't hear it as well. Oh sure, sorry about that. Thank you. No problem. I I think my my answer. Um, to, to this question is that that's 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 kind of the the core goal of of this mission to end HIV criminalization because so many of these HIV criminal laws do not take into consideration whether harm occurred or whether there was a risk for harm or whether someone intended to do harm and and. Th that's that's why these laws fundamentally conflict with the long-standing legal notion that we only prosecute and punish people who intend to harm someone else. So that bringing bringing you know HIV criminal statutes up to that legal standard is 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 um, you know the the core goal. And I you know I feel like that maybe answers that question. Great. Thanks, Amir. And Sean sent me a chat. His audio might be um, a little malfunctioning where he, he says the case of um, true malicious intent is incredibly rare. And the bigger concern is people who may not intend to harm but may transmit without a conscious intent to harm. So in those cases, there might be a mental health issue at play. And in Sean's view, the situations are best dealt with in the context of public health system rather than the criminal justice system. Thank you, Sean. If I can add, oh, go ahead. Great. Glad we can hear you again. Yeah. The, um, a lot of the statutes, they say, intend to transmit AIDS or intend to transmit HIV because it's the having intimate contact with someone without disclosure or without various kinds of protection is sometimes construed as the intent to, to transmit, when in fact, true cases where there has been an intent to harm someone are so rare, you know, I can list them. There are like three or four of them. You know, you know, the doctor in Mississippi who injected his infant child with HIV because he didn't want to pay child. I mean, they're like really extreme, bizarre cases. However, there are cases when someone, for whatever reason, they don't have access to treatment, they don't understand uh, the risk they pose to others, or they're dealing with their own kinds of depression or addiction or other kinds of mental health issues, uh, they do transmit to others, even though they don't intend to hurt them. And those are the, the difficult cases where, you know, we believe they're best dealt with in the context of the, of the public health system. There are people who need help who are falling through the cracks rather than uh, the criminal justice system and, and, and locking them up. Excellent point. Thanks so much for sharing, Sean. Um, at this point, we don't have any other questions in queue. 
Are there any other points that our panelists want to share with the group before we wrap up? Great. Well, huge thank you to our, all of our panelists. Huge thank you to Jonathan for pulling this together. And big thanks to all of you who called in to spend an hour with us this afternoon. Really appreciate it. And um, hope to hear from you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.